Again. Okay, are we starting? Are we good? Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Um, for those who may not know, this is Nathan Liveron and Son, our shop, where we've been since March of 1949, uh, almost 73 years. And um, I am joined by uh, my chief associate, mm -hmm. Kevin Tulameri. Uh, I'm Arthur Liveron and our technical staff of Sarah Levine and Gigi Liveron. And uh, this is our maiden voyage for a virtual forum. We have done these for 10 years now, and we've never done a virtual because of the pandemic, we had to be creative. So um, we're going to discuss veneer today, but primarily we're gonna be speaking about this high boy which is a pretty special piece. And um, so as far as if you would like to uh, ask questions, um, if you can ask the questions through the chat room, and then we will be able to respond to those questions. Please ask questions. People know who come to in their life here at the shop, uh, just bird out uh, questions and we're very happy to uh, discuss them and, you know, we can bring up any subject. So um, anyway, we'll start. Kevin is uh, waiting in the wings here and uh, we're not sure. We, we don't rehearse. This is totally spontaneous and uh, we're not even sure who's going to start here, but go ahead, Kevin. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Glad you can make it. Thanks for joining us on our maiden virtual Zoom voyage. So in talking about the high boy that we have here, which is a Queen Anne walnut veneer high boy made in coastal Massachusetts around 1730, 1740. Um, I thought we would get into the history of veneer and where the uses of veneer came from. I'm very aware of a veneer is a very thin slice of wood and the thin slice of wood was cut in the 18th century when this was made by hand. But the history of veneer goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. And that's uh, over 3,300 years ago, uh, the pharaohs had their parts of their tombs and even their household furniture, everything was made from veneers. So they were very expensive and exotic. So it was reserved for the pharaohs and only certain types of objects were used. Uh, one of the examples that I thought was most fascinating, see if I can hold this up to the camera. Here's a pair of shoes that actually sandals really that were owned by King Tutankhamun. And so he died in the year 1324 BC. And the sandals are decorated with images of Asian and African slaves. So as King Tutankhamun would walk around in his veneered sandals, he would be treading on the images of his enemies and opponents. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting use of veneer. So when the Greek and Romans were early exposed to Egyptian art and design in about 500 BC to 1000 AD, uh, both the Greeks and the Romans started imitating Egyptians and using veneers on some of their formal furniture as well. Uh, this was enhanced by the Roman conquest of Egypt, which became part of the Roman Empire in 30 BC. From that point on, there is a long gap in the use of veneers uh, until the Renaissance in Italy and France, which basically extends from about 1420 to 1610. And it was that Italian and French Renaissance that were looking back to the Greeks and Romans and trying to imitate that classical style. Uh, the Renaissance used a lot of robust carvings, but they were also interested in really high quality veneers and decorative elements. Um, and England in the 17th century started to adapt some of this designs from the uh, Renaissance furniture. 
uh, especially after the restoration of King Charles II in 1660. Now he was in exile before his restoration in France and that led him to be exposed to this French interest in the Renaissance and the veneer designs. Uh, in England in the 17th century, they were more interested and had a lot of access to native woods and that's where uh, walnut veneers became very popular. And like on this high boy here, that's also walnut veneer. Uh, in 1690 in England, those designs became very elaborate and had a lot of interlocking designs and repeating designs with cross banding and contrasting colors of light and dark wood veneers. And that translated into colonial America in the William and Mary period, 1675 to 1730. Again, was that same English tradition of walnut veneers and repeating patterns and borders and designs. Uh, and then we get into this period of the early Queen Anne. And really this high boy shows that transition from the William and Mary period of the late 17th century, early 18th century into the, 18th, the 18th century, 1730s period. So that's my little brief dissertation on the history of veneers, but I thought it was really interesting how that all connected all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. So as Kevin said, it's been used for thousands of years. The interesting thing is when we look at furniture and decorative arts, it goes through cycles. Still today, clothes, designs, housing, architecture, we go through cycles. And this is pretty much like the first cycle using the veneers. And this high boy is truly, it's, it's a very interesting technique uh, of how they did it. And this is the original veneer. And it is still, considering it was made around 1730, it's hard to believe that um, it is original, but it is, we'll, it's no question. And the way we know that is that we came across a print and Kevin is going to hold this up on how they saw uh, the veneers. And you had two guys and uh, apprentices and they're sawing um, a log and probably walnut because uh, it's usually that wood and they had a guide. So all the veneer was going to be approximately the same thickness. However, today, one of the biggest pitfalls that we find in veneered early furniture is it's replaced because the veneer fails or the glue fails. And um, so we have from our cabinet maker, a sample of some veneer. This is actually a piece of 18th century veneer. And if you could see it up close, and I know you're not going to be able to really understand this unless you actually put your fingers on it to see the thickness. But this is the real stuff. This is the real McCoy. And one of the ways we know that is A, the thickness, and B, if you turn it around on the back side, there is the marks from what we call a tooth plane. The tooth plane, which is this. This is a tooth plane and the blade actually has like ruffles have ridges, potato chips. If so, if you kind of visualize a potato chip down to this size, it made it so that it had more grit uh, and more surface area for the high glue or animal glue to bite in. And we actually can see right here, I can see it with my, you know, my eyes. I don't even need a magnifying glass. And it goes the entire length. So the high glue, which has also been used for thousands of years, 
It is the best glue. It is no question the best glue because it expands and contracts. Unlike new glues that are so, um, they don't budge. They just don't budge. They crack. And wood, wood especially expands and contract with humidity, with the seasons, you know, your doors in your house, you get a rainy night and the next day your doors are a little stuck. Well, that is because of the expansion contraction from humidity. And today, and I was speaking to my cabinet, our, one of our cabinet makers today, and he said, you know, do you know why so much of the veneers have failed over the years? And I said, well, I guess it's because it's so thin. He said, no, the cabinet makers never anticipated central heat. They had no idea that in the year 1950, that everybody's house was going to have a thermostat and they could turn the heat up and the humidity goes down, the temperature goes up, and pretty soon the expansion and contraction gets smaller because the wood is, it just doesn't expand anymore. And that was a very interesting conversation I had with him. And he said, you know what? Veneers are really temperamental because you really have to get it flat. Now, if you were lucky to be here today and really touch this and get the raking light from the big windows, you could actually see the bubbles, the, uh, the cracking, uh, the, and these two, so the, the veneer is actually not that big, but these are what we call matchbook. So it's a board that they sawed really small and then they opened it up. So if you could see it really close, the left side and the right side are actually from the same board. It's truly remarkable that they could pull that off. And, and you see how they're designed. They were very certain about what they wanted this piece to look like. And so when this was new, I mean, I love the color of it now. It's just, you know, the wood is, it's so deep. You can put your fingers in it, but I wonder what it looked like when it was new, uh, when it was just done and what did they use actually, because it would have been very fresh looking. So I'm sure they put some kind of a coating on it um, to um, sort of cut down the fresh saw marks. And so um, anyway, so this is a joy to own because we never really find so many, such a piece in so amazingly perfect condition. Uh, it's a joy. And the, one of the things that we discussed this morning with our cab maker is walnut is a pretty hard wood. And it's almost always veneered on white pine, often Eastern white pine, which is a soft wood. And so it has a lot of expansion and contraction because the wood is very soft. However, the walnut is a harder wood and doesn't expand and contract quite as much. So I asked our academic, what do you think? I mean, we had our theory and we've always had our theory of why they would put this on Eastern white pine rather than a hardwood such as maple, birch, anything that doesn't expand and contract much. And he said, money, it's all about money. And it was then too. This piece was made in Boston. The Boston cabinet makers were really good, but they were making a living like all the cabinet makers. However, once you move out of the urban areas, a lot of times the cabinet makers like in Colchester, they made the things out of thicker wood and they wanted it to last. And maybe in Boston, where they were, you know, being in major production, they didn't have the time or the money perhaps to use really top quality hardwoods to veneer on. 
So it's even more amazing to us that the veneers survive so well on certain pieces. And that's what's so amazing about this piece because there they almost isn't any repairs. Uh, there's a few around, as Kevin mentioned, around the drawers is what we call a herringbone. And it sort of encases uh, the drawer fronts and even on the herringbone. So this must have been a really well cared piece. It probably was in a great environment. They didn't have central heating. And um, so that's one of the reasons it survived so well. Here, I'll just come up to the camera and try to give you another good look at the, uh, the quality of that pearl walnut and the book matching of the fletches of the walnut veneer. And those are, I tried to say this word before, sequential. All right. Those are sequential pieces of veneer. So they were the pieces that were cut one right after the next. And so the cabinet maker had to keep track of what pieces of veneer that he was using. And the herringbone around the edge where the cabinet maker would use also a piece of walnut, but a straight grain. And he would angle the grain one way and then angle the grain the other way. So this border is really two pieces where the grain meets in the center and forms that herringbone design, which is really, really nice. Um, I'll turn it around and show you the inside of the drawer front. And this is the Eastern white pine that was used for the construction of the drawer front and the walnut veneer. I think it's kind of interesting and see if I'll get the light but in the corner right here is the knot. And that's the knot of Eastern white pine, which is a very knotty wood. And often we'll see that kind of distress in the secondary wood will come through in the primary one. So because of the different shrinking quotients, you can see here in the corner, that's where the knot was, where you get a little bit of extra stress in that veneer. And if I can get the light right a couple of times, you can see those shrinkage cracks in the veneer. But really, I like to call those beauty marks because it really shows the age and the authenticity of the piece and that this veneer is original to this drawer front. And that's really an important part of judging these pieces and handling them and understanding them. And as we were, Arthur was talking before about the thickness of the veneer, here's one of the areas that we look at around the drawer edge and around the drawer top where you, it'll be hard to see online, but you, that's where you get a look at the edge of the veneer. And that's where you wanna make sure it's a more substantial thickness. I don't know if it's even a 16th of an inch, but it's much thicker than modern veneer. Modern veneer is paper thin. And actually the first veneering machine was invented by, was invented in 1806 by an English French engineer. Oh, I, I have his name written down. I'm not gonna get it. Um, yeah, hold it. Because he's an interesting guy. So the first veneer cutting machine was invented by Marc Isambard Brunel who was born in 1769. And like I said, he was a, a French British engineer. He also invented the Thames Tunnel. I say that right, Thames, the Thames Tunnel, the first underwater tunnel in the world. So he was a really creative and interesting guy. In that era of 1806, the Industrial Revolution, they were starting to create all sorts of tools and machines to make veneering, uh, make industrial production much easier and quicker and cheaper. Uh, and by 18 and eight, 1818, he improved his machine from knife cutting to the first circular saw. So that's when the circular saw came in to be used. And one of its first application was for cutting veneers. We have a question. Oh, we have a question, okay. What are the drawer sides and back constructed of? Okay. Good question. What, and I'll repeat that. What are the draw sides and back and bottom? And we call that the secondary wood. On this particular piece, the primary wood would be the white pine and then the veneer. 
So the secondary wood can vary. Um, in Boston and in Massachusetts, the wood of choice oftentimes was white pine. It was available. And then, um, but in Connecticut- And this, and this piece is all Eastern white pine. Right. Sides and bottoms all throughout the whole piece. And that is the drawers. The secondary wood is often a indication of where the piece was made. Um, and so in Massachusetts, Eastern white pine was plentiful. They could go up to New Hampshire. They could go into Vermont or Western Massachusetts. And they still had, even in 1730, they still had an abundance of white pine. Um, my father had a friend who was a great historian of American history, renowned historian. And one night he was telling us that, you know, during around 1774, 1775, the revolution was not the most important thing to people in Boston, not at all. It was staying warm because they had cut down all the trees around Boston for building houses, building furniture, building ships, whatever they were doing. And so they had to go 40 miles outside of the center of Boston to get firewood. Now try think of what the effort was to bring firewood into Boston using ox driven carts with no chainsaws and really it, the, the exercise is mind boggling. But so one of the ways that we know Rhode Island furniture is that and Southeastern Connecticut was the extensive use of chestnut, which is a wood that we really don't see too many other places. So when we do see a, a piece of where the secondary wood is chestnut, it gives us an indication that it was either made in southeastern Connecticut, perhaps Rhode Island, and maybe the southern part of eastern Massachusetts. The chestnut bike took care of that. And by the 19th century, there was no chestnut left. So before we leave, and Kevin just brought up the subject of how thin the veneer is, this veneer, the old, which Kevin is upholding, as compared to the new, is a difference of half. And so the first thing that we do when we're trying to determine the originality of a piece, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to identify that, but the first thing that we look for is we look at the, we pull the drawer out and we look to see how thick the veneer is and you can usually tell by the right on the, to the silhouette, the cross section of where the veneer is applied to the draw front. And we know, and it's pretty, pretty specific thing. And Kevin and I will look at each other and we'll say, it looks good so far, or no, this is not old. And it always breaks our heart because we always want the piece to have the original veneer. That is, you know, what we really look for. And so when we saw this one, uh, we were excited and I'm still excited, even though it's sold, it's going to people who are really gonna love it and cherish it. And um, that's what makes our job so much fun. So one of the things that I'm gonna show you, um, yes, we have another question. You do. You have a question from Mr. Jaramet. He'd like to talk about the grain direction of the drawer bottom, and is that contrary to what would be used today? Okay. The question is: the the direction of the secondary wood. Um, does it is it important to identify a maker, perhaps a location, perhaps? And a lot of people put a lot more weight into that than I do. Because I think a lot of times the cabinet makers used what they had available. 
Um, this is a sort of classic Boston technique, front to back. Now in Connecticut, where we had a lot of open forests and we still had great forests of uncut wood, we would find one board that going horizontal for the draw bottoms. And what I'll do is uh, in a moment, I will pull a drawer out um, without knowing exactly, but I'm gonna gamble that this piece right here probably has draw bottoms that go left to right. But I wanna show you something that Kevin and I discovered one day and it was, it's a great discovery and we have great fun with it. For many years, um, my father and I, and I was in business with my father for 29 years, we would see uh, and the top two drawers, if the high boy or chest on chest had it, we would see a stain right here in the center of the drawer. And we couldn't figure it out. What, what was there? And so one day we pull the drawer out and I'm just standing there and holding it. And I think, oh my God, my hand is there. And so in the 18th century, when these people were working the farm, didn't necessarily have the soaps, the hygiene maybe. And so this is the hand oil where they would hold the drawer if they had to get something out of the top drawers. You can't really, Kevin can't do that with a big drawer. You just can't balance it so well. But if I pulled out both drawers, you would see the stain of hand oil. And so these are the forensics that make our job really fun because whenever we examine a piece of furniture, or examine anything. There has to be a pathway to originality or we're not interested. We have to be able to explain why certain things happen. So, um, and since I have this draw out, the cabinet makers in the 18th century, chalk was their primary source of marking. If you look back here, you can actually see the chalk marks. Believe it or not, it's indelible. Once it goes on into the grain, you can't get it out. And so, yep, there's Kevin's got a mark right there. And cabinet makers all had their own little system of how they would mark things. And it's always fun to see, now in Kevin's draw, that is a, it looks like a little arrow. That means the top of the draw is this part. And we often find consistency from one drawer to another. You're up. All right. So, and going back to the uh, drawer bottom question, which I think is really interesting uh, and really helps us again with the placing this piece in a regional context. And as Arthur was mentioning, these big drawers you can see, and this is actually a shrinkage crack, but there are small pieces of wood that are joined front to back. So here's one, two, uh, three pieces of wood across the bottom that are used to make this bottom board front to back. And that's a technique that we do find in Boston, but it, it was something that started in England. In England, they were much more interested in wood preservation, conservation, well, within the workshop, because they didn't want to use excess wood and they had smaller pieces of wood to work with. So they would use this front to back drawer bottom arrangement and something we look at when we're trying to judge whether a piece is English made or American made. Uh, but in Boston, they were so highly influenced by English workshop traditions and a lot of the craftsmen were coming from England directly to Boston. They continued the use of this front to back construction of the bottom boards of the wood. So I find that really interesting. And again, showing that direct connection to the English craftsmanship. Um, 
I think and uh, the question also had a part about whether what how it relates to wood construction today and it may be more likely that you would find in reproduction furniture front to back drawer bottoms as well or if they put the drawer bottom side to side kind of the traditional new england way they may have to use one or two pieces of wood with the seam going horizontally so that's really something important to look at uh, but what we do see front to back drawer bottoms in a coastal massachusetts piece it's not unusual that doesn't concern us it's very appropriate so Arthur made a discovery. So to continue front to back or horizontal left to right, this is a Connecticut chest on chest. And we have many examples of New England furniture primarily around our shop. And I just looked over here and I thought, well, that's a good example, guessing that it's going to have left to right one board. And that's exactly what it is. So in Boston, uh, think of this. And Kevin was just saying that Boston cabinet makers followed the English tradition. Well, the tradition was front to back in smaller pieces. England was in production for 5,000 years. There was nothing left. England was out of wood. Um, I don't know, my wife's giving me signals. I don't know what she's trying to tell me. I'm supposed to look at the iPad. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, the board is so thick. You can see the thickness here. So what the cabinet makers did is they put a chamfer on the edges with, with a rabbit where the, champ, the chamfered board goes into the rabbit. And then they put two nails in the back, sometimes three, and that holds. And so it's only attached in the back, allowing for expansion and contraction from front to back. And the board that goes in to the rabbit is probably in about this far. So the board can shrink and expand, but it doesn't pull out of the rabbit. And that's not a R-A-B-B-I-T, that is a R-A-B-I-T. <laughs> and um, so if you were here, you could actually feel what we call the Jack Plain marks, where the cabinet makers apprentice in most cases, took this big thick board, planed it down, made the chamfer edges and got the draw so that it fit really well so that it would fit uh, among the into the and hold the drawer together. And I have to say, holding that drawer, it weighs about four times <laughs> as much as the other drawer. That's really heavy construction. And uh, if I had another set of hands, we could really compare that thickness. But in just seeing that thickness of the bottom board, you can see the thickness of this board is just so much thinner. And again, that kind of interest in preservation of materials. Yeah, get a real Can close up there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good good comparison. And even the, like Arthur said, the technique of construction and how it's made all speaks to its regional characteristics and regional origins. Just another kind of interesting element that we find on, on this Queen Anne Walnut veneer high boy is that these drawer sides and even the drawer back are have a double arch molding and you can see that that goes around the top of the drawer edge and around the back it's really pretty rare to see it on, along the top of the backboard uh, but we do find it in coastal Massachusetts this double arch carved edge which gives the piece a really nice finished look, but it also has a quality of function that allows for less surface area when you're pulling the drawer out of the case. If the drawer happens to tilt and the drawer front gets unaligned, drawer front comes down and gets unaligned, there's less surface area to bind up on the drawer blade. So there's a little bit of physics there as well as decoration. 
And just to show you, this hot, this chest on chest, the draw sides has what we call a single arch motor. And it's also on the back side. So whoever made both of these, and unfortunately we don't know who made these pieces, they're not often signed. Uh, that's why when we do get excited, when we do have a signature or a label of the maker. I think we have another question. Yes, what are the years of these two chests? I'm, I'm sorry? Construction of the two chests. Okay, the, the high boy was probably made around 1730. And the chest on chest made in Connecticut is probably made around 1780 to 1785. And we can tell that by styles. And that's how I introduced the program. The type of feet that this particular piece has is what we call, and maybe you can't see it, is what we call an OG bracket foot. That foot became popular around 1750, 1740, 50 period. So we know we have a parameter of when this piece was made. Then another thing that we see is we have these, what we call bale brasses. These are federal style brasses that were made in England and sent over here um, for the cabinet makers. Uh, there was even during the revolution, there was still a lot of trade going back and forth. Money talks. And uh, the cabinet makers here needed brasses for their pieces. And so they would order these from England. And so that piece, these brasses almost make the piece, um, they almost date it for us. Also the, the design of what we call this pinwheel up here, which is truly remarkable. This is the star of this particular piece. It's really special. So. These are two pieces that, and we didn't anticipate that we were going to contrast and compare these two pieces. Uh, but it, I'm glad that we happen to have two so close to each other that we could do this. Um, so let's see. Uh, then we, we decided that beyond the high boy, we were going to introduce other pieces that have veneer. Uh, and you can see how the veneer changes from one style to another. And so Kevin is going to get a mirror. Um, okay, go for it. All right, and this is actually a Queen Anne mirror and it's, it's related similar in period to the, to the high boy. So staying within that same realm of, of walnut veneer, uh, starts to get into the Chippendale period with this carved uh, shell here in the crest that's pierced and carved and kind of like the rosette on the chest on chest starts to introduce another element of decoration beyond that surface decoration of the veneers. But what's really interesting in the, in the world of veneers and the world of mirrors is how these Queen Anne mirrors will show the effect of aging. And so when I turn this sideways, you can see the arch of the crest of the mirror. And that's the activity of the pine on the back shrinking at a different rate from actually the pine and the walnut on the front, which is sealed in with hide glue. So the front of that single piece of pine that makes up the crest is sealed on the front and open on the back. And so that over the 200 years of aging, we get that shrinkage and that arch to the crest of the Queen Anne mirror. So that is an interesting effect of that aging of walnut veneer and Eastern white pine secondary white. Uh, it happens on the lower crest as well, but it's usually much more pronounced on the upper crest because it's so, it's a larger piece of wood with a larger piece of pine, a larger sealed in surface area. So that's a really nice example and typical of mirrors of this period. We attribute them to American or English. It's hard to judge exactly where some of these were made because they made them at both styles. 
in this 1730 to 1760 era. Uh, but when we really look closely at the pine of this mirror, and maybe Arthur will agree, and we didn't really look at this before, but this has a really wide grain to the pine. And to me, that looks like an Eastern white pine piece of wood rather than the European pine. It tends to have just a very thin straight grain. Uh, sometimes that's called Norway spruce, uh, but this has that wide grain of that Eastern white pine. So I still think we would attribute this as American or English, but it has some features that suggest an American origin. Uh, and it's just a really nice, pleasant design from that Queen Anne period. So I'm going to add something to this. I mean, Kevin was discussing the bigger piece versus the smaller piece. When you hang a painting or a mirror or anything on the wall, the top always hangs out a little more than the bottom, just because that's the physics of it, right? So the top always gets more air and more exposure, whereas the top fits up generally right across the wall and doesn't get the exposure quite as much. So the physics of this whole thing is really quite remarkable. And then I'm gonna add also, if you could look closely, you will see that the veneer have many cracks. And that's because the pine on the back is going horizontal, left to right. The veneer on the front is going uh, north and south. And so you, because the two elements, the two different types of wood are shrinking in different quotients, you get these cracks. And people will say to us who might not understand, we consider that the beauty marks because it, we love that shrink, those shrinkage cracks. You can't fake that. That is the real McCoy. And so that's really important for us to see. I mean, we can have it flattened down by our cabinet maker and it's probably a wise thing to do, but until somebody buys it and has their choice, we can get our cabinet maker to really clean it up and put it back. And, uh, but um, well, there's a lot of purists who love to see that cracking because it means something. It means purity. And, and with that purity, um, I was, an author was showing the back of this mirror. You can really see the graduation of color and the, the changing of the oxidation that's much darker at the top and lighter at the bottom due to that effect of hanging on the wire and hanging further away from the wall at the top. So that just has something to do with oxidation and age and that natural color of wood that natural patina that, especially Eastern white pine, gets this beautiful, warm, rosy red to rich brown color. And that transition from dark to light, top to bottom, is also, again, one of those things we look at for uh, authenticity and originality. Sarah's got another question. What design elements make that mirror Queen Anne? So. Okay. It, this is all Queen Anne. If the shell wasn't there, it would be pure Queen Anne. However, Mr. Chippendale, Thomas Chippendale, uh, reinvented a lot of the designs of the Greco-Roman designs of thousands of years earlier. And so when Thomas Chippendale brought these new designs in, the cabinet makers were anxious to give them a try because Mr. Chippendale's father was a great architect. And Thomas Chippendale was, didn't want to be an architect. He wanted to design furniture. So what, they, what he did was, uh, okay, let's jazz this stuff up a little bit. So he introduced this carved shell. And so, that, so this is actually a transition from Queen Anne to Chippendale, and we always call it the latest design. So we will call this, if people want to call this Queen Anne, they certainly can. If they want to call it Chippendale, they can. It's a transition period. 
You know, it's like women's, I say women's fashions are constantly changing, constantly. And so men, not so much. We wear the same things over and over again. A jacket, a jacket was 30 years ago, it's still in style now. But this Queen Anne style hung around for a long time. And the Queen Anne was, she wanted her furniture and decorative arts to be very graceful. And you get this very graceful curves. And uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother form that we'll have another day and explain the difference between Chippendale and Queen Anne. Yeah. Well, and I think that, so the basis of the Queen Anne form is the C scroll. And so when you see simplicity and C scrolls connected and interlocking, and you want that graceful curve from one element to the other. And so the Queen Anne elements of this are the shape of the crest, which is simple but nice, and with kind of a C scroll in the center, flanked by interlocking C scrolls, which is really an S curve. And the same thing, the prominence of this C scroll, just a nice simple plain curve on the outside of the ear. And then these connected C scrolls on the inside of the ear. To me, that's really pure Queen Anne. And also the lack of the side ears. So when you get into the Chippendale period, most of the mirrors tend to have an additional scrolled element applied to the side on the top and on the bottom, which we call the ears. And so that additional element of applied decoration that makes the mirror, the object project further into space. And that's the Chippendale or Rococo aesthetic is that they really want it to project into space and make it visually exciting. So the shell is starting to get towards that Chippendale idea. But I think this, to me, this is a Queen Anne mirror because of the prominence of that simplicity, C scroll and simple curves and simple lines. So I couldn't wait to really, one of the really wonderful things about this mirror is this, the veneer has separated enough from the pine backboard and you can actually see the thickness, easy as, easy as day. And maybe we can pick that up with the camera. Um, it really is quite clear. So that is a really good lesson on how the veneer followed the curve of the white pine caused by the expansion and contraction and the high glue sealing the wood on the front part of the pine for the veneer to be glued down. So, um, so okay, so now we start to get into the next period. Uh, and my wife has given me the motion of, all right, time to finish up. Um, well, and uh, as, as we're talking about that, sure. As we showed that chest on chest from Connecticut with that carved rosette, there was a little bit of a break in the interest in veneers during the Chippendale period as they went into more solid woods and a more of an interest and focus on carving like that carved rosette of the chest on chest that made that the, the fashion. So they would come later on back during the federal period to the uh, federal design to the use of veneers. And this is a federal card table made in coastal Massachusetts around 1790 to 1810. And these panels on the front of the card table are made of book matched flame, probably birch veneers. And it had a really great light effect and contrasted by this cabinet maker with mahogany cross banding surrounds and the solid mahogany top and legs. So they were using solid wood as well as veneers to activate the visual aesthetic. So as Kevin said, this was made around 1780, 85, up to, up to about 1810. And this, we had won the war against England and we were really proud of ourselves. 
Um, so they started to make this great furniture and make it flamboyant and make it really proud of what we had accomplished. And this is a great example of using furniture to sort of display, uh, you know, the patriotism of the period. And using veneers just like this, only this is 50 years later, 60 years later, the same techniques, but now it's come back in style. Uh, well, one thing I want to see if we can look at is the way that this apron is formed by the use of probably sectioned, cut, and bent. Well, it has a cross rail underneath it, but this board here on the front is made of sections, laminated pieces of eastern white pine that are stacked on top of each other to create that bow front effect. And um, I, I don't know with the shadows and everything if we can see that, but that's something that you see in the federal period where they're laminating these eastern white pine boards to create a, a shaped form to put the veneers on top of. Just finish with this. No, we got time. We have time. Yeah. Okay. So we have a couple of small pieces that became prizes because of the veneer. And this piece, I think, is really special. And it is a woman's sewing box or jewelry box. We call them valuables box. And on the front of, there are two plaques. It's, this one says Marie Gansefort Fort Melville from her father, Thomas Melville, October, 1814. And then down here, it gives Marie Gansefort Fort Melville her date of her passing in 1874. June the 10th. So who is Miss Melville? Herman Melville's mother, the great author who wrote her, uh, Moby Dick. So you can imagine that when Herman Melville was a little kid, he probably was going through his mother's jewelry box to see what she's got. And I find that a truly fascinating and there is a picture, a portrait of Marie Gansefort Melville. This box was given to her the day that she married Mr. Melville's son. And so I just think the history of this box, not only that, but the quality of the box, and it still has the original kit leather and um, the knobs and it, it's just a, a great special thing, but what is it? It's veneer. So the veneer on this particular piece is bird's eye maple. They wanted to make it really special and flamboyant, just like this piece to show, you know, this is the best I could get. And thank you for taking my son off my hands. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, Maria Gansfort Melville has a, a great history and both her own father and her husband's father, uh, who was Thomas Melville, were important Revolutionary War patriots. So in a way, this was a great coming together of the Gansfort family from New York, the Melville family from Boston, um, her Maria M Gansfort Melville father-in-law, was a member of the Boston Tea Party and was active in the Sons of Liberty. And so when they got married, Maria married Thomas Jr., uh, she was given this great box. And it's, the, as Arthur said, bird's eye maple, really beautiful imported brass lion head handles on the side of it. 
Uh, and then you can see some of that detail around the edging of the box too, which is figured maple. So it's relying on American materials, but taking them to the different level, and, you know, highlighted by the imported English brasses. But it's interesting, it looks like the inside, the, sec the wood here is mahogany. So the primary wood, I believe, is mahogany with the bird's eye maple veneered right onto that. So as if mahogany wasn't luxurious enough, they took it to the next level and added a, a figured bird's eye maple veneer. Uh, and again, you get the uh, little bit of cracking and distress, you know, the aging and the beauty marks uh, throughout the top that make this really authentic and genuine. Really what we look for in a great antique is that, you know, that age, that patina, and that makes it really something that's not new and not, you know, something off the shelf. So I have to show you one thing. And um, if maybe you can see it on a profile, the lid actually moves. Uh, this is a dry period of, in our shop. The heat is on, the door is not open, and uh, so it's dry. So the board, the secondary wood is shrinking, making the lid lift in the front. And perhaps you can see that, but during the humid, months of the summer, the board of the secondary wood will expand and it goes flat down again. So it's like this piece is alive. I mean, it's constantly moving. And uh, it's the first time I saw it happen, I was very greatly distressed. But then I thought, well, let's wait and see what happens. And as the humid months came around, June, um, and we had some rain and humidity, it went right back down where it should. It's just amazing, really. Yeah, we have this little table that was made about the same time period in, in Boston as well. And it's a federal one drawer stand or work table. And it has maple construction, solid maple to the top, solid maple to the legs, but the drawer fronts and the sides are decorated with bird's eye maple and a mahogany cross banded surround. So this is a really kind of subtle but nice use of veneers to give this table a little bit of added visual excitement. Uh, the figure maple would have been nice. Uh, even just a plain maple on the sides I'm sure would have been nice. Uh, but this cabinet maker went all the way around the table and even the back has a bird's eye maple veneer, mahogany cross banded surrounds. So it's really a sculptural object made to be seen out in the round. And yeah, this was also made around 1790 to 1815 and has a really unusual uh, batter sheet enamel knob, uh, brass on, on the drawer. And the Melville box and this table, I think it, in the past have been associated with the workshop of John and Thomas Seymour. I don't think we'll make that association or attribution at this point, but we know it came out of a very high quality Boston workshop. Uh, and that's where they had access to those Battersea enamel knobs that really helped it stand out and be, you know, really, to the, piece. to the person who asked about the front, the back, and um, horizontal, in this particular case, the cabin maker took up one board, he nailed it right here, here, and here, and four nails, which was nailed into the sides of the draw, eastern white pine. But eventually, as the draw dries, it gave way. The nails were going to hold, but the weak part, which was the center of the board, cracked. And there again, that doesn't bother us. It's like the cracks in the mirror. It all proves the reality of it, the proof, and what Kevin calls the beauty marks. <laughs> and so 
We'll just finish up with Oxalis, which was this one is a tea caddy, and um, because tea was very important, that's why the tea party was tea. Uh, that wasn't just happened to be picked, and so the this is a handsome box with a lot of veneer. So you can see how the veneer changed over, and this is about a hundred years after the high board. And, uh, but the pattern, the idea still held and remained for a long time because it was always treasured. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we just got that one last box from uh, Pennsylvania. And this is a box that has an interesting story to tell. It's made out of several different types of veneer. You have mahogany, uh, burl, uh, a darker mahogany, maybe rosewood. So this box was made in Pennsylvania. And the farther opens up the tray. On the underside of the tray is the label of the maker. It says Philadelphia, November the 3rd, 1838, uh, Jacob Schaffer, maker. So that is really what we love because pre if without that label, we wouldn't know who it was made by, when it was made, but this gives us a little insight into perhaps it was a gift to uh, somebody dear to him, maybe a daughter, a spouse. Maybe it was made for somebody specific to give as a gift. It probably is a little sewing box. And uh, so it's, he really made a great effort with all these different woods. And um, the veneer is, the, is it, all the secondary wood is mahogany. And uh, it's just a little treasure. So you've seen two treasures, the hot boy to a little box. So All right, and let me, I'll just get a little closer to the camera to try to show off some of the details of this box. And so I went through the census trying to find information on Jacob Schaffer and who, who he was and where he came from in Pennsylvania. And I was able, I wasn't able to find a cabinet maker by his name. And I was, there was a couple potential Jacobs to choose from, but I was able to find a saw maker by his name. And the making of saws and the making of veneer saws in particular was a specialty at that time. So I wondered if this was a piece that maybe Jacob was involved with uh, in making the saws, making the tools, but then took it one step further to become a cabinet maker. Because this really shows the design and the quality of a great cabinet maker, you know, really well skilled, and I just, I love the way it's put together. And again, those real subtleties of the different types of veneers, uh, burls and figured mahoganies and that precious medallion in the center. So it's a really great quality box and really happy to have it. And I think it offers a, a great story to, to tell. Sarah, any other questions? Not at this time. Okay. Well, thank you all. Do you want to open it up for questions? Yeah. Okay. Anybody wants to ask we, questions? We can unmute and ask questions. Okay. We can unmute and you can actually speak it, um, and we can hear you. So um, don't hesitate. Nobody gets a test. <laughs> you won't get a test in the mail. Um, but if this is successful, if people like it and it works for people, uh, we have another one scheduled. Yeah. Uh, All right. I'll give you the rundown of our schedule. And uh, so please go to our website, liveronantiques.com. On our shows and event page, we have the full listing. Of course, we're starting to get into the period when we would have been at the Winter Antique Show in New York City, but that show has been postponed until the spring but we thought we would have our own version that we're calling a virtual hibernal show. And so we're gonna try something a little bit different. And it's gonna start on January 20th with a preview party. 
where we're going to be here live on Zoom, and we're going to unveil a piece that we should be that we would have been bringing to the Winter Antique Show. So if you want to see something that's new and special, that uh, is something destined for that great show, we'll be happy to present it here. And then follow that week following when we would have been at the show, we're offering offering a whole series of events and a sale with 15% off on different topics, different types of items for different days. So while it's for two days, we're gonna have Boxing Day, where we have all types of antique boxes, which was one of our specialties we had at the winter show each year. The 23rd and 24th, have a seat. All the chairs on our website and here in our shop will be 15% off. The 25th and 26th is hang out with us. Uh, artwork and anything that hangs on the wall, needlework, textiles, wall hangings of all sorts. The 27th and 28th will be turning the tables. So any type of table, card table, sewing table, work table, which whatever you can find here or on our website, and then we'll finish it on January 29th with a folk festival. And we're gonna have all sorts of folk art, whatever you can find here in our shop, from folk art drawings, folk art carvings, folk paintings, that's 15% off. And also on that January 29th, which is a Saturday, we'll be again here live on Zoom from two at, starting at two o'clock with another virtual forum. So go ahead, tell your friends, invite your neighbors, get together in the socially isolated, safe way that you can. And, um, you know, we'll just get together and we'll try to share our passion for early American antiques. And we couldn't do it without you all. So thank you. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And um, you can throw tomatoes. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.